I came to this institution in 1932, and I was six. And my father uh, had just been appointed principal of what was then the university college. Uh, the college itself had been founded, as you've heard, just after the end of the last first great war, uh, and was only a few years old when it was founded. Uh, and he took over in 1932. Uh, it was um, an extraordinary place for a six-year-old boy to come. A marvellous place, I may say. There was only one big building on this plot. That was the Fielding Johnson building, uh, which, as you everybody will know, particularly in this medical context, was in fact um, a mental hospital originally. Uh, and it was a, a, a dignified building, and we ourselves, my father as principal and uh, my brothers, uh, we lived uh, in the what was the superintendent's house, which is now called College House. Uh, and growing up there was absolutely a fabulous thing to do. It was uh, an extraordinary place. I, just, I could tell you things about the cellars of, of the Fielding Johnson building. I don't know what they've done with them now, but we knew wonderful ways in which we could play, as under, though it was a cave system in which my brothers and I chased one another around with candles and things. Very, very exciting. My father's job, uh, he, he himself was uh, um, a, an Anglo-Saxon scholar, uh, and he came here with... Um, particular interest, of course, in the English faculty, but he soon found that the job of the principal of University College Leicester, which had not yet got its own charter and was operating as a sort of offshoot of the University of London, the job of his job was actually to raise money. Uh, and so uh, all sorts of na people whose names are enshrined in the buildings uh, around uh, this one uh, came, I knew personally. Fielding Johnson had died in the 20s. He, it was he, Fielding Johnson, a businessman in Leicester, who decided to buy Fielding Johnson building, the hospital, the old hospital, and as a foundation for a university an extraordinary act of generosity and philanthropy. But my father then had to in encourage other people in the community to give. And he that, so I, I came to know, they all came to the house. Uh, there was Ashley Clark, who was a, a prominent doctor, who was very, very important. There was also a, a businessman called Sir Jonathan North, uh, who was the boss uh, of the, uh, uh, the great boot and shoe, uh, Freeman, Hardy and Willis institution. And I remember him very well. He was a, a small man, and to my mind, uh, a saintly looking man. He had white hair and a, and a, white, <laughs> and a white beard. And uh, my, he would, would go into the front room and have consultations with my father about whether or not to be generous. Um, and, um, and then when, when he left, I and my two brothers, uh, Richard, my younger brother John, uh, we were lined up to sort of stand on parade and, and say thank you. And we'd, I remember one occasion very clearly. We were standing there and out came this old gentleman, I thought at the time, he came out and we were introduced and um, to my astonishment, I was introduced, I shook hands, and to my astonishment, Sir Jonathan North put his hand in his pocket and he took out a half a crown. Now, in, that was the old imperial days, that was two shillings and sixpence, uh, and my pocket money at the time was tuppence out of that two shillings. <laughs> so I looked at this in astonishment, and I looked up to him and I said, Thank you, Saint Jonathan. <laughs> and he said, Saint Jonathan? And he put his hand in his pocket and he gave another half. 
I won't say necessarily that I learned a lot from that, <laughs> but what I will say is that this university has benefited hugely from uh, private philanthropy and the citizens of this great city. My father um, saw it through, of course, uh, to uh, the, the um, uh, to giving of the university grants which came after the war. Um, and uh, that was indeed a great occasion. Um, but looking back now and th at all the people who give them so much help, I am struck by the fact that the one thing he and his benefactors alike yearned to do was to have a medical school. Now, in the University Grants Committee after the war, uh, there was much competition to get national backing from, from the government for the development of the university. And this university was a natural competitor when it came to the medical school with Nottingham University down the road. My father was actually born midway between Leicester and Nottingham in a small village called, believe it or not, Attenborough. <laughs> and there was a friendly rivalry as to who was going to get the medical school. Dr. Astley Clark, who you mentioned, was very keen. He was the local doctor. There was a Mr. C.J. Bond, who was the surgeon and most distinguished servant in the Leicester Infirmary. And they all worked hard. But in fact, that grant from the University Grants Committee for a medical school uh, went to, as you know, Nottingham. Whether Mr. Jesse Boot and his factory alongside Nottingham and Boot's chemist had some influence with the business, I don't know. But certainly it went there. But now things have changed. Now, if I may say, I have to say, thank you, St. George. 